<clears throat> hey, good morning, everyone. It's Thursday morning, and we're close to the weekend. Uh, and uh, hopefully your day is off to a good start. Hopefully, uh, if you uh, have kids, young kids uh, in your home, uh, they weathered the storm yesterday of school starting. Uh, at least uh, some of our schools started yesterday. I know there's another one of our uh, private schools that was starting today. Um, and then uh, some more as well but later uh, early in next week. So um, school's back in, in full swing here. And uh, it's kind of strange to see the school buses out and see the flashing um, school zone lights and all that kind of stuff and so uh, I just think it's good if we just continue to think about keeping people in our prayers um, think about the teachers that do such a great job and important role play a, such an important role in the life of, the, of our kids and uh, just um, I don't know just pray that, that God will use the school year to, to for his glory we pray that the Christians who are on campuses all over the county um, would be able to shine uh, a bright light um, to represent and reflect Christ and all they did and all they do and say, and uh, that we'd see lives transformed on school campus this year. How awesome would that be if we saw those things take place? So, I'd uh, be praying for our students and praying for uh, teachers and the faculty at those schools as well. Uh, today we're back in the book of John, the Gospel of John. We're walking through this kind of chapter by chapter and looking at the stories of Jesus' life. Um, and uh, one of the things we see here is that in John chapter 6, we, we enter this, this kind of 48-hour period of like absolute chaos in terms of busyness. And uh, so we know early in chapter 6, Jesus feeds the 5,000. Great miracle, awesome thing. Uh, later that night, he sends his disciples on across the Sea of Galilee. Uh, there's a big storm, and then all of a sudden Jesus shows up and, and walks on water uh, to them. And there's this real weird moment where they're not really sure what to think. And is it a ghost? All that kind of stuff. He eventually says it's him, and um, he uh, comes on uh, on board with them, and the winds calm down. Tells us they get to the other side of the sea, and uh, in uh, of the side of the Sea of Galilee, and the people are looking for him. Actually, in chapter five. Uh, verse 22, it says, The next day the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there uh, and that Jesus had not entered it with his eyes, but, but that he had gone away. Um, so it says, once, it says, Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into boats and went to Capernaum and searched for Jesus. So all those people who were there when he fed the 5,000, uh, the next morning they wake up and they're like, wait a minute, where's Jesus at? He's like, he didn't tell us he was leaving. We want to go see him some more. So they figure out that he has left and gone to the other side of the lake. They get in boats, travel across to go meet him. Halfway through chapter 6, we see them catch back up with him. This is in verse 25. And this is one of these really interesting dialogues that we have with Jesus here. Because really what's going to take place in, in the rest of chapter 6 is Jesus just begins to lay down this fundamental gospel center teaching that at many levels was really hard for them to hear uh, because it wasn't exactly what they thought they were getting into. Um, so chapter 6 verse 25 says, when they, that's the crowd of people looking for Jesus, when they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? And Jesus answered, verse 26, very truly I tell you, you are looking for me, not because you saw the signs not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him, God the Father has placed his seal of approval. So Jesus uh, says something really interesting here, and I think this is important, uh, worth noting, is that Jesus knows the heart of man. Right? He knows what's inside of us. He knows our motives and our intentions. He knows all that stuff. And so these people who saw Jesus feed or witnessed him and experienced it, feeding the 5,000, right, yesterday, have now tracked Jesus down, and they come to Jesus, and they, it almost sounds like an innocent question, but I'm certain that there was more to it than this. 
But their statement was, Jesus, where did you go? We've been, we've been looking for you. We want to hear some more teaching. We want, to, we want to know what you're really all about. Would you lead us some more? Would you do some other uh, great teaching for us? And Jesus calls them out on it, right? In verse 26, he says, you guys are looking for me not because you love my teaching, not because, not because you're so enamored by the, um, enamored by the miracles or things of that. Not because you want to be blessed and enriched spiritually. Jesus says, "You guys are looking for me because I gave you some food to eat. Yesterday we had a good meal. Yesterday, and you're like, hey, if we hang around with this Jesus guy, maybe we'll get some more food, right? And and so there's a selfishness in in some of that in their motives that they had." And I wonder about us sometimes. Do we really follow Jesus for the right reasons? Um, do we really love him because of who he is? Or is there other motives that we have? Now, obviously, when we first put our hope in Jesus and put our faith in Jesus, part of the draw to Jesus is because we don't want to go to hell, right? We don't want hell. Um, we uh, we don't want the punishment of our sins. We we certainly want to escape those punishment that punishment but as we grow in our relationship there should be become a desire to know jesus there should be a desire to follow him not just i don't want to go to hell but i get to be with jesus i get to serve him i get to honor him it turns into a, a love relationship with him years ago i read a person who spoke this and i don't remember who the first person to ever say this is but just a really neat analogy and the person asked the question and said um would you be okay? Um, would you be okay with heaven if Jesus wasn't there? Meaning, is the only reason you want heaven so that you can have what you want and have a great place to live, or is your intention to go to heaven so you can meet Jesus and spend time with Jesus? Right? What is the most important? Um, I think about that sometimes in our life, and I think Jesus was hitting on that very thing here when he said. You're not here because you want to hear my my message and the truth. You're here because of what I gave you yesterday. You want another meal. And I wonder sometimes if we, do we really love Jesus or do we just love what Jesus offers us? And I want you to think about that for a moment. Do we really love Jesus or do we just love what Jesus offers us? Right? Because there's a difference there. Right? Do we love what Jesus offers us, or do we really love Jesus? I think about that in terms of, I don't know, a couple weeks ago or whenever it was, they had that, uh, the, the mega ball, mega million ball, whatever it was, the big lottery thing that was going on. And, um, and it was like, I don't know, like $1.2 billion or something like that if you hit the lottery. I think the cash payout for that, if you took the cash, if you're the only winner and took the cash payout, it was like, I don't know, it's like six hundred million dollars, something like that. Listen, if you if you got uh if you got the six if you got six hundred million dollars and people knew about it, you would immediately gain a lot of friends that you didn't have before. We know that, right? We understand how money changes, all that kind of stuff. You would immediately have a lot of friends. Why? Because they would want to be with you because of what you had to offer them. I wonder sometimes if we don't do that with Jesus. If we don't love Jesus and follow Jesus only because of what we get from him rather than him, right? And I just think there's a there's a an evaluation of our heart that we need to kind of take in that. Jesus calls them out in this and says, listen, if you're not really for me, yeah, then, then you don't need to be with me. Um, do you love me because you love me or do you love me because of what I can give you? Um, and there, there's a difference in uh, all that. Um, then Jesus get in, gets into this teaching um, about uh, doing good works and things of that nature. Um, <clears throat> and uh, they get into this discussion about um, what is good works. And verse 30, it says, uh, so they ask him, what sign will you give that we may see it and believe in you? What will you do? Verse 31, they say, Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. And Jesus uses that illustration. He says, listen, yeah, you, your, your ancestors did some good things, but it was God who gave that to him. He says this, Jesus said in verse 32, Very truly I tell you, it's not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to all the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread, saying, we want that bread. 
Jesus then says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never thirst. Jesus here is identifying the fact that he is the Messiah come to the earth. He is the living bread of life, that if we eat of him, if we partake of him, if we participate in the fellowship with him, then we will have life eternal. Um, he uses another illustration here in verse 49. He says, um, or let me go back to verse 48. Verse 48, he says, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which any man or anyone can eat and uh, not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, and I will give for the life of the world. Jesus is saying, listen, all the things that, of the world, all the traditional stuff, all those man-made things, they don't fully and finally save us. They will not. Only Jesus does that. And so it's not about our works that saves us. It's not about who we know. It's not about our grandparents. It's not about how long we've been in the church. What, what saves us is the work of Jesus at the cross, that he is the one who gives us freedom and life. And I just think that's important. We'll talk a little bit more about that um, our next time together because there's some more things that Jesus says and just don't have time for it today. So think about that and uh, ask yourself that question. Um, do I really love Jesus or do I just love what Jesus has to offer me? Uh, let's pray. God, thank you for your word and the instruction we find in it. Thank you for the challenging words of Jesus that convict us and shape us. Help us, God, to be more like your son in all we do and all we ask and in how we treat other people. And this in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, guys, have a good afternoon. We'll talk to you soon. And uh, hopefully you guys have a great weekend. Come see us on Sunday, 8, 9, 30, or 11. All right, God bless.